Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is word magician Laurel Erica. Hello, everybody. Today, our guest is Laurel Erica, a distinguished English linguist. Her poetry, books, podcasts, and videos are all deeply educational and unveil the power, magic, and mystery, and even black magic and trickery used in the English language. When I first saw her present on the English language, I was blown away by her depth, passion, wit, and honesty. She truly is a wise woman with a lot of life experience, and I'm very excited to share Laurel Erica with all of you today. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. The title of our podcast today is Word Magic, Awakening Through Word Play with Laurel Erica, someone who I have a lot of love and respect for. She's an amazing human being, and I think you're going to be blown away with what you learn from Laurel today. I know when I first came across her, she blew my mind. Laurel Erica is a distinguished English linguist. Her word magic, word play, is what puts a spin on the world, which is a spin on words. <laughs> and I'm going to start by just letting Laurel introduce herself to you a little bit. Laurel, welcome. It's great to have you. And I've enjoyed our many interactions and all the things you've shared with me. And I'm excited to share you with my guests. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much, Paul. So my name is Laurel Erica. I'm an alphabet alchemist, oracle of the metaphorical, and cultural commentator to the highest denominator. Sorceress of the Thethoris, my words are coined of heavy metal, so need no ironies for weight. For truth is gold, and I won't settle for less when I communicate. My purpose is to comment with light humor and with eloquence on the state of earth air, fire water, and assorted other human elements. I think Most you covered it. <laughs> oh, there's more. I'm sorry. I, I thought you were done. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Most especially on the language, for I've every reason to suspect it sounds our depths and thus reflects its impact on our intellects. Now, my poet's license specifies I'm not to judge or criticize, yet who, I ask, has better right than does the poet to indict, which means to blame and arraign when spelled I-N-D-I-C-T, but which also means to compose or write when spelled I-N-D-I-T-E. Now, poetry, potentially, can be a form of alchemy whose potency, once it is stirred, invokes a world with just a word. So my verse is quite intentional. It's metaphor dimensional, yet full of fun, for I am proud to speak in metaphor and pun. No close facsimiles allowed. It's for this reason I was born, to fill the land with jubilation. For to my maker I have sworn to use the word for recreation. So this will be my resurrection, to share with you my deep reflections upon the layers of implications inferred by word reverberations. Now, from these words, you may deduce I'm the metaphysical mother goose, and my poetry's a celebration of the English language in translation for I know the wavelength on the English channel. So I'm here to mother, to mother goose our usage, to help turn the tide, since our current annals reveal what a twisted tongue produces. Now, uh, yes, I know that you won't be surprised to hear that we've been hypnotized so the special thing I'm here to tell is that our word 
create the spell. And that our problems are compounded because English is confounded for the echoes of our history and our psyche are resounded through the symbols of the alphabet as well as through our puns. And yet few recognize what thoughts are stirred by the secret spells of the unheard word. And that was powerful. Thank you. Uh, sorry, my vapor bag was a bit dry, so I'm coughing it up, but uh, oh. that, ra- that rarely happens. But I was certainly enjoying it while I was <laughs> trying to find my center. <laughs> well, I have to tell you then, uh, though I know you're not smoking cannabis, that my first rap I wrote when I was 20 and a student at UC Berkeley, and it's called the Marijuana Sutra or Splendor in the Grass. <laughs> <laughs> I have to share it publicly, but I will soon. I, I think that's fantastic. I love that. I love I love the the magic of marijuana. I just uh as I was sharing with you earlier, if I smoke that while I'm working, I don't get anything done except dreaming. I, I wrote an uh an article called um pot valiancy because the word pot valiant means courageous on a count of being drunk. But on this occasion, I was pot valiant in that I had a job pre-internet for a a big research firm. And I was a little overwhelmed by it. So I decided I'd clear my head before going to work for the second day. And I took a toke or two. And then I went to work. And then what happened was that everyone became transparent for me. And I started doing readings and suggesting to them some changes they might want to make if they want me to stay. And I just was in another (laughs) show. Then I was too high to to go actually learn what I was supposed to be learning there. So I went down at 10 in the morning to the little restaurant where I knew the president would be hanging out. And I walked through the doors and I heard a voice say, the aliens have landed. So I went over and I found him and I said, I took a little grass before I came in. I didn't expect to get so high, but I need to go home. I'll see you tomorrow. So when I came back on my third day at the job, um, I was very um, contrite. I felt like um, I'd come out of hiding and was too exposed and I no longer had the level of confidence. So the president walks in and says, we'll have to talk at the end of the day to see if you want to stay and if I want you to stay. So the end of the day comes and he then invalidates all my perceptions. Like I had objected to the fact that the researchers were playing ping pong against the wall right next to where I was sitting, trying to learn this mammoth electronic typewriter. And um, he informed me that at the Niels Bohr Institute, where all the Nobel laureates hang out, they had worn a hole in the carpet playing ping pong. So everything I said, he gave me a refutation. And he said he couldn't believe the speed with which I perf- I uh came to my perceptions and the arrogance with which I expressed them. And so I went home and, <laughs> and that night, and I thought that my, I knew what an earthquake felt like because I felt like my brain was splitting. I had someone like my mother who was invalidating everything I had to say, and I thought I must be crazy. The next day, or a couple of days later, the owner finally shows up. The president walks in the door belatedly, looking bedraggled, and uh, has a meeting with the president and then leaves. Then the president calls me into the office and he said, John told me what you did. And I'm, Ugh. and he says, I want you to know I've tried everything with John. I gave him a raise. I gave him a new sports car, anything he wanted, and um, he doesn't show up. So you know, at the level I need. So I've just fired John and I'd like you to learn your job (laughs) (laughs) and then take over as a company. (laughs) That's so good. So you see, there is magic in a little puff now and then. Oh my gosh. Truly, truly. Yeah, that's great. 
Um, can you share your secret word spells? Yes. So um, this is the video that people discover me through. And I share what I call our premier life sentence, which is that we awake each morning and go off during the weekdays to earn our living at various jobs and undertakings until we come to the weekend. And everyone agrees that that's the normal way of things. And then I quote, I believe, Deepak Chopra, who said, more people die of heart failure between 6 and 10 a.m. Monday morning than any other time of the week. So I explained that what I do is a translation of the English language. And I spell it T-R-A-N-C-E with the idea that words cast spells that put us in a trance. So when you translate that life sentence, you remember that awake is a party to celebrate the newly departed. Morning <laughs> is the state you're in when you attend awake. You're in a state of grief. So when we say to each other, good morning, we're also saying on a subliminal level, good grief. In other words, we're sounding a heavy note in someone's consciousness at the start of the day, which does nobody any favor. So we would have to be staggering around in a week days, like a zombie, to earn the living, since urns are ashes for the dead. Urns are vases for the ashes of the dead. We call our jobs undertakings. Job itself is a Hebrew word for persecuted, which is Job. We are racing to meet deadlines. And what we get at the end of this hyper stressful days of the week is the week end of the deal. So when we say have a good weekend, what a depressing note to sound for someone else when it's all about Saturday. And now a satyr is like a really wild little nymph. And, but it could be a Saturday, S-A-D-D-E-R, if you're now busy working uh -huh. on everything you haven't been doing. And then there's Sunday, which is about a uh, rebirth. And so to call it a weekend is to uh, make a very different, um, sound a very different note. So we call 10 years of living this way a decade. And I've heard some English people call it a decade. And so, yeah, call it like it is. And so our most prevalent greeting to each other is hello. And if you reverse the syllables, you have oh, hell. So some people have <laughs> heard this. <laughs> some people are now uh, around the world, I found, are now saying grand rising. So that brings up the point that we can, we can – put in new words. We can invent language anew, and we can also tune it up because the English language is like an out-of-key piano. It sounds a lot of flat notes and a lot of sharp notes where they don't need to be. So we can tune it up word by word. And uh, when we are so inspired, I always ask higher consciousness to work with me and awaken ideas within me because genius is a place in consciousness. It's a space everyone can access and not the province of a few lucky people. So I asked some in a group of people, what do we do about the word hello? And one woman said, how about hallow? And to hallow is to make sacred and to recognize each of us is sacred. And so your turn. That's really good. You know, it was that video that a friend sent me a while back, you know, uh, I think it was a few months before I reached out to you because it just, I kept thinking I've got to get a hold of Laurel and have her on the podcast because that one video just blew my mind how profound it was what we were actually saying to each other unconsciously, not really like, you know, we, when we are going to school to learn English or to learn how to communicate we don't get taught really what the words really mean. We get taught what we get taught, which obviously isn't telling us the truth of what we're really saying. 
Yes, exactly. Well, most people don't notice this. For instance, the word taut, T-A-U-T, it's T-A-U. So uh, learning, when you're taught something at school, it's T-A-U-G-H-T. When you're tense, which happens when you're sitting in school being taught, you become taut, T-A-U-T. You become contracted, stressful, which is a cause of nearsightedness. So I think very small percentage are born with vision impairment, but by adolescence, usually following traumatic events, uh, vision deteriorates. So people don't look, people are taught to watch what they say rather than to listen or to do both. So these words just pass right by us without our noticing them. And there's a whole subliminal curriculum in this negative programming. For instance, with children, we refer to the new, the new arrival and older siblings, as well as the the partner may feel that this child is a rival for the affections of the mother. So we also talk about every little while we have to change the baby. That baby needs no changing. Those diapers need changing. But to impress sublimely, so it goes on and on and on, Paul. Yeah, and we'll get into some of that too because there's I've got some questions oriented to that. Um, I'd love it if you can just give us a little biography of your life and what sparked your passion for the pursuit of the deeper meanings and truth of the English language, because it's, you know, in my whole life of 60 years now, I've never met anybody that has this depth of knowledge and passion for helping us understand the trance that we're in. So how did you find this path? So there's lots of ways to tell that story. One of them is that it was very Alice in Wonderlandy, because um, my father was uh, an artist and he liked to paint to classical music. And a delivery man came and um, was unpacking a Magnavox monaural sound system for him. This is 1948, I believe, and. I, as a toddler, came in to see what he was doing. He told me a bat had uh, flown out of the box and landed in the tree in the backyard. So I went running out and stood before one of the very few trees in the backyard in this desert town. Um, And I was looking to see the bat. And I realized, at least as I recall it, at that moment, that I was expecting to see a baseball bat hanging from it. And that, Ah. that was... First time I knew that words that were apparently unrelated might have the same name. What kind of weirdness is that? So I went in pursuit of that bat using what a friend called echolocution to listen to that way sounds bounce between words and then to start putting them together to see that even though they don't have the same etymology, they have different histories, yet they've traveled across cultures and continents and um, centuries to come into the same vibration. So I will give you some examples which are favorite ones of mine. The fact that praying and so savage, yet it also sounds divine. Or how about the way the prophet has become our bottom line? Now add worship or worship, parish or perish, and you'll soon understand why the world's so nightmarish. So I, I, I pursued the bat, and it took me many places. And please, you interject, and then I can finish that story or pick up the thread of another. No, no, I I, I just thought you were done again. But I I just think that, you know, there there are many words, you know. And, and for example, whenever whenever I'm teaching, if I'm using a word like God or love or soul or spirit, Mm -hmm. because there's just a myriad of different, so many of those words are personally um, P 
people have their own interpretations of them. Very few people actually know the dictionary meanings of words. I tell my students all the time, if you're studying orthopedics and you don't know the difference between an osis and an itis, you're going to get very, very lost. You know, so the the thing that I do is I lay the groundwork with my students so that they know exactly what I mean, because as the teacher, if they don't understand what I'm trying to convey, then what happens is they actually think that I said something completely different because of the way they attach meaning to words. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I once was sitting with a professor that I worked for and I was overlooking his Zen garden and I said, it's very elegant. And he said, well, it's graceful. Anyway, it turned out we had opposite meanings for the words graceful and elegant. I look at elegant as ornate. He looked at graceful as ornate. I looked at graceful as simple lines like Zen. He looks at that as elegant. So that, I mean, it's obviously people have different concepts for words like God and all of that. Uh, but what that points out, the elegant, graceful um, controversy between us is that there are so many words where we essentially don't know what each other is thinking and saying and are full of our projections based upon our history. So we're hardly encountering the being right before us. And, and, and in this process, we're creating all sorts of energetic experiences that may not be pleasant. So precise speech is so important. And uh, when you speak with my friend, Jeffrey Armstrong, Kavind Rishi, he will explain how Sanskrit still used today, still spoken by some, but the Vedas were written in Sanskrit like more than 5,000 years ago. The language has not changed. There isn't what he calls linguistic drift that causes such a deterioration of meaning. <clears throat> and I'm soon going to be releasing a book of essays I wrote around obscure words. It's called Defining Moments, words that invoke a whole world in a few syllables, if you know what I mean. And I'm doing so because there are so many beautiful words that have been either lost to posterity or downgraded in their meanings. And one of those words is anamnesis, A M A N. E-S-I-S. -S. And what it's defined as, the first definition is a soul's recollection of the knowledge it had from parentheses, supposed, close parentheses, other lifetimes. In other words, the dictionary wasn't going to let that go by uncommented on. So the supposed recollection, I mean, the recollection of knowledge from prior lifetimes, anamnesis. Do you know what it now means? A patient's medical history. It means to forget or something. Oh, is no, that that's right? Amnesis. That's amnesis. This has an extra syllable, an amnesis. And what it means now is a patient's medical history. Rather than the knowledge your soul brought in with this life, now it's your a history of your sickness. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not very healthy. No. Yeah. No. Given that you essentially have double audition rather than double vision, how did the world look to you when you were growing up? Uh, we already kind of got a sample of the bat, but there must have been some other interesting experiences. Well, I had so many questions that nobody spoke about. And I thought I must be very backward to ask such basic questions. So I didn't ask them to reveal and, and reveal how backward I felt. Um, one of the questions had to do with the moon. Sorry for the background noise. So um, I wrote my fairyography, which is about an elemental being who goes through the looking glass into this dimension and has to deconstruct the language to find her way back home again. So in the middle of page one of the first chapter, uh, my fairy self, Philomela Nightingale, says, 
I was born in upside down town to the king and queen of backward land. I spoke a foreign language which they had to twist to understand. The king was sowing sorrow and the queen was reaping grief. I held my dreams but lost my way, confused beyond belief. How ossified the king in patriarchal misconceptions, and how brilliant was the queen in monumental self-deceptions. And I wish that I could say that they were singular exceptions, but they were the rule, as I know you'll confirm with your reflections. So that's a little vignette about what it was like growing up with the king and queen of backward land. Well, you know, I felt the same way. I'm sure I you didn't did. feel it. I didn't feel it uh, because of my confusion about words. I felt it because I couldn't get anybody to answer my questions. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, and there, <laughs> first of all, the adults are not of sound mind. Um, I had questions too, like who said A, B, C, D? But you know, you don't ask a question like that. And so I had a dream once that sort of encapsulated what it was like growing up in the, uh, in what would I even call it, among my family. My parents said one thing, did another, denied all of it told me it had, it had never happened, that I'd made it all up, and how could I after all they'd done for me? So I call that a quadruplicitous mindfuck. Yeah. And finding my way out of backward land required being of sound mind, listening to the echoes of words and hearing the mindfuck in the language. Yes. It's sad. Isn't it? It's it's not only tragic. <laughs> so that leads to another little short verse that came to me spontaneously when I had a little tiny bit of chocolate edible after 13 years of abstinence while driving down the highway. And this is what came through. If my healing from a mind fuck helps correct the English vision, then by God will I be grateful for the pre-life soul decision to design a life assignment that could lead to my confinement on a planet that's confounded by a language that could damn it. My life's mission, my legacy, has always been to teach the teachers. When I founded the Czech Institute, it wasn't to teach the masses. It was specifically to create masters that could impact the masses and reach far more people than I ever could. Just as a picture is worth a thousand words, a master has more power to help and heal than a thousand average healthcare professionals. If you listen to my podcast, then I'm confident you're already aware that the world is in a health crisis. This crisis isn't something that would be a crisis for healthy people with the wisdom to support the planet in healthy ways, as most native cultures did. It's a health crisis because of corporate greed and manipulation of the truth of what makes people healthy by the medical systems worldwide. Sadly, they're in the illness and disease business, not the healthcare business. The mission of the academy is to teach the teachers how to live and how to teach holistic health for both the professionals of the world and the masses. How the Czech Academy does this is by providing you with all of my courses, academy-only online seminars, and business training so you know how to run an effective holistic health business. It's structured so that you get the right training at the right place with the right mentors to succeed. Students are supported by group mentorships and a community of like-minded students. It's much easier to learn grow, and share when you have a tribe of intelligent, healthy, inspired, and motivated people, and that's exactly what the Czech Academy offers you. Great teachers are people who live or have lived what they preach. In the Academy, you will be taught by masterful instructors that model for you every step of the way what it is that you're meant to do, how to live, and what to teach. Learning from masters 
in a mastermind group setting will help you grow personally and professionally and create a practice you know truly helps people. If you're interested in applying to the Czech Academy to be the change the world needs now, go to chekinstitute.com forward slash L number 4 D Academy. That's chekinstitute.com forward slash L 4 D Academy to apply now. I'll tell you what's coming up for me uh, through this conversation. And it's something that's deeply concerning because the more time I spend with you, the more real I realize we're in a Mexican finger trap. <laughs> and and the 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 issue that I'm I'm stewing on here is the English language is becoming the world standard. I mean, people all over the world are studying English, but they're not learning the language like you're teaching it. They're learning the spells and they're getting spell casted. So my question is, why in the hell do you think English is becoming the standard language? And my second question is, of the languages that human beings speak, you've mentioned Sanskrit. Are there any other languages that you do find favorable? I'm not an authority on other languages. So um, I took us a bit of French, a bit of Italian, managed to learn none of it well. So I, I'm not in a position to comment But I, uh, on that but in terms of other languages. Um, in terms of English, this is, this is so interesting to me and so deep. Um, let's see where to jump in here. I wrote a poem called Open Heart Synchrony, which is a vision of how exquisite it will be when we endeavor together to create an enchanting living language of supernatural poetry that scintillates so sensually that everything around us will vibrate sympathetically. So that's the first stanza. It goes on three pages. And when I was writing it, I thought, to myself that I was really um, too ornate here, that I had gone overboard. And then sometime later, but I couldn't stop. <laughs> sometime later, I, in Santa Monica, walking the streets, I started talking with a couple. And it turned out to be Ann and Whitley Strieber. I don't think you know Whitley, but he's one of the first early experiencers. He wrote the book Communion. He's got many, many other books. Brilliant, brilliant man with a lot of experience with whatever that is. Um, Are you talking about plant medicines? No, no, no. I'm talking about aliens. Or what, oh, what we okay. Aliens. Yeah, he's one of the first alien experiencers that we know of. Had a lot of public... Oh. Anyway, became friends with Ann and Whitley. They gave me a copy of a book by their friend, William Henry, who is a mythologist and historian and has a book called The Language of the Birds. And it turns out that English is the language of the birds. And the Kabbalah of English that I speak and downloaded in nature, he describes it exactly as that. He said it's it's the green language that Solomon spoke of it, and that it's not exactly um, the, la uh, the language of birds, but of angels. So we have this very potent creative force that everyone is using or not every, many, it's the most widely spoken uh, language in the world. And it has us sentencing ourselves to some horrible <laughs> and unnecessary fates. So my, the purpose of what I do is to demonstrate that we're in a hypnotic spell through the very words with which we converse every day. And that that language is software. I mean, I could do this little piece in verse two, but you might want to get say more things. So, but language is software, and English is the leading software of the Western mind. And what happens with software? You upgrade it, and that's a collective enterprise. So, <clears throat> here's a question that I think's an important one. Now, inherently, I already know the answer from my own perspective, 
but I want to see how you respond to this question. When we speak a language, as we've been discussing, and we don't realize the implications, we may actually think that what we're saying is simply what we're saying. But because language is vibration, and vibration is the force that organizes life itself, the question is, wouldn't it be true to say that we are actually creating things in our life without realizing that we're doing it, but then trying to figure out who to blame or how to justify the pain, the problems, and the challenges we're creating that we created unconsciously? Amen. Yes, absolutely. We are uh, condemning ourselves as we speak with a language that is subverting our consciousness. I had a dream once in which I was uh, either listening to or reading a very advanced linguist who said that when, once we have upgraded the language, and my vision is that it becomes as harmonious and growth producing as bird song and cricket choirs. Once we do that, um, he was saying that the new beings coming in will not have to forget who they are or why they're here. Um, right now, <laughs> Uh, people uh, at a very early age start going into what I call I am nesis and am, am, I amnesia rather. Uh, we forget that it's the, the uh, temporary loss of infinitely long-term memory. And in this dream, this advanced linguist was saying when we tune up the language, that will not occur. You know, it's interesting because in my studies of music and music theory, one of the things that turns out is, I don't remember the exact date, but they changed the frequencies of notes in music and threw them into something that's considered by experts to be out of harmony. What, what is the human need to keep uh, fucking everything up? <laughs> Well, I don't know if it's a human need or uh, another dimensional need um, <laughs> to create this absolute insanity and self-destructive behavior. But we talk about English. English is the language, uh, you know, through which so much church dogma comes forth. And um, and this idea, it's a fucked up idea to begin with. Like when I talk about uh, that life sentence, uh, I also say at first, well, I believe that what it echoes and reflects, because we're in this hall of mirrors and echo chamber, which is life on earth and all the sounds, that what it echoes is the vision of a universe irreparably divided by conflicting male superpowers, the fallen state of humanity, the misery of life, and the inferiority of women. So that's why we talk about awake, morning, entrepreneur, deadline, days of the week, weekend, and oh hell. You know, you know what that really brings up to me intuitively is that <clears throat> one of the books I studied by Ken Wilbert might have been a, a, a brief history of everything. He he explains that our education system that we use to this very day was developed by plantation owners to control slaves. And the schooling was designed for two key purposes to keep the children busy so that they could get more work out of the parents and to program the children to not think creatively so that they would do exactly what they were told. But why I'm bringing this up is because what you're describing with the days of the week and all these things, it's really sort of the language of people that are trying to get out to, to escape 
you know, week end and all the all the drudgery. And it almost sounds like it's the language of slaves that are just not happy people. What is there any uh, you have any thoughts on that? Oh, definitely. So it makes life seem futile and futile means hopeless, but it's also um, an economic system, F-E-E-A-L. Um, children are, you know, the idea, it's, there's so many things. So first of all, we call a child a pupil. The eye is the window to the soul, and here is this open pupil into which this garbage is being impressed, because not all of it by any means is garbage, but that which is not updated with with new discoveries and um, personalized for the child's own innate genius, so much of it is unnecessary, irrelevant, and disturbing to their peace. So we call it lessons, L-E-S-S-O-N-S, but lessons, L-E-S-S-E-N-S, is something that diminishes you. And the people who develop this are the, the self-proclaimed board of education. And yeah. by, the, by the time kids are released, they too are, are board of education. Though the learning, as with the, uh, the avidity that you practice, is natural for all of us. But so many of us lose our sense of connection to the divine uh, and our access to our own genius or even a belief that we have it. And we do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and what also that brings up in me is, you know, I, as you know, I've studied a lot of people. And one of the interesting things is if you study Rudolf Steiner, it's very hard going because he invented so many words and almost all of his books are just straight out dictations of lectures that he gave to advanced students. And there's often not an index in those books. There's no glossary in those books. So it takes tremendous patience because you may have to read 30 or 40, 50 pages before he actually explains a word that your brain's been hung up for 30, 40 or 50 pages. And it used to drive me crazy. It took me years of studying Steiner to actually learn his language. Then you study Jung. He's got a whole mass of words that he created. So the point I'm driving at is I could go through my library and give you 50 books written by geniuses who actually invented their own words because there wasn't anything appropriate to express something meaningful in our language. Well. You, as the powerful <laughs> rock stacker, weightlifter guy, I'm not <laughs> surprised <laughs> that you did what few would do, which was to persevere and wade through it till you learned his language and then Jung's language and then others. I mean, that's stupendous. And I am in such awe of that. I'm sensitive to vibration and I thoroughly and firmly believe that all of creation is vibration. And so what I do is I let my soul guide me to books. And I'm, if I'm in a bookstore before I buy the book, I hold it to my heart and I see what the vibration of the book does to me. And if it brings me into a place of centeredness and a sense of expansion, then I know that what's in the book is important and valuable because it's adding harmony and it's adding by expanding my field. It, it gives me the sense I'm really growing. If I don't get that, I don't care how famous the person is. I won't buy the book because I already know without even reading it what it's doing to me. So but my point, the reason I labor through a lot of these books is because my soul and the vibration is telling me, if you learn this language, you will be more able to express and access your own genius because these people will touch your soul. But you're going to have to listen carefully to get the words that unlock the door to the parts of you that you have anamnesis with. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's gorgeous. That is so beautiful. And how wonderful that you are such a clear and accurate barometer uh, in your experience of energy and your interpretation of the experience that you can trust yourself so deeply and fully. Well, you know, the thing is, is I have a lot of responsibility as a teacher and I have a lot of responsibility as a therapist and a coach. People come to me from all over the world with very serious, sometimes life-threatening and career-threatening challenges. And so I feel it's my responsibility to be a finely tuned instrument because I don't feel safe guiding people and answering their questions when really I need spirit to guide me. And I always tell people, I can't make a decision for you, but what I can do is help give you the information so that you can make your own decision. My job is to provide the, the viewpoints or the information that maybe a person doesn't have. So what, what happened is at, I began my career working with medical failures and they were very complicated cases, but I found that I didn't have enough knowledge to deal with people that were this complicated. So I reverted back to my training from the self-realization fellowship and I just went into meditation and asked my soul to connect me to that person's soul. And I, I, I did what a shaman calls emptying the bone. I just made myself an, a, a drum skin and let their soul talk to me. And so from years and years and years of just letting that person's soul tell me what this person needs to wake up to or what's wrong with them when the doctors can't figure it out, I was able to help countless people that nobody could figure out. So I just found that the world is so confusing and the world is so um, conflicted and the medical system is just aside from emergency medicine, the medical system is a complete and utter failure. So I really felt that the only way that I could navigate people's lives without misleading them was to let their soul lead me to lead them. And that takes, um, it takes a commitment to healing yourself and to spiritual practice and to becoming aware enough to know when you're out of tune in yourself because because then i my instruments damaged you know like if i'm if i'm in a bad mood and i have to help somebody that's sick there's no way i can separate my bad mood from what their soul's trying to tell me so then my bad mood it gets to be part of their situation and so there's a a lot of responsibility to it but uh but what i wanted to throw in is I'll tell you whose books are powerful. Rumi. You know the poet Rumi? Of course. Yes, I was waiting for your next words. Yeah. Well, word. yeah, no, you know, just I have his entire collection. Over, I probably got about 40,000 Rumi poems. I've got the Mothwane, which is 25,000 poems. It's the master collection. But I probably got another 50 or 60 books of Rumi's poetry. And I was just heavily drawn to Rumi. And I used, I used to go into shamanic ceremony with plant medicines and I would just hold a book to my chest and just absorb it vibrationally. And then I would start writing poetry and it would just flow out of me as though Rumi was writing through me. And there, I just wanted to make that statement to say, there's an example. And a lot of those poems, as you know, if you get real Rumi poetry, not sort of the commercial stuff, they're very deep and they use a lot of complex phrases. And I had to buy multiple Islamic dictionaries and Farsi and trans books on translations. But the, the point is the vibration on those poems is incredibly high. And it would be uh, sometime when we can get together personally, I'd love to sit down with you and some Rumi books and open them and let let's see what kind of language he's using so that with your ev level of of being able to break it down and, and see what he's really saying it would be very an interesting experience thank you well that sounds delightful and the way you have described yourself is the way i wish i were 
Um, <laughs> You're uh, doing pretty good. <laughs> well, it's all intuitively derived. I have not been a great scholar. I did not know I was smart. I learned years later when I was studying with a psychic that when you come in, the more advanced you are when you come in, the more backward you can feel. I I believe I came in as a linguistic and metaphysical prodigy and nature mystic, and I was treated as uh, a half wit and a bad seed. So I didn't know I was intelligent, but just like a plant that's been blocked from the light, my hungry mind went searching. And and I came in to do this work with the English language specifically. And there are times when I feel like a living embodiment of an elemental embodiment of the English language, elemental. And this is what I came to do is to help people wake up to it. And this has been the direction of my research. I wish I were like you, an autodidact polymath. But my mind has tended in this direction and my sense of purpose with it has kept me alive and kept me going in the face of significant obstacles. And so my intention is to inspire people to do what those mystic, uh, magical geniuses that you gravitate toward do, which is invention of language. And at the same time that I posted in 2010, The Secret Spells of the English Language, I also posted Taking Command of the English Language about how we can each, how and why we can collectively create and share words that can convey a higher frequency of consciousness and inspire a greater frequency of kindness. Um, those geniuses have led the way. We are all geniuses. And doesn't matter how, uh, you know, the gaping holes in our education personally, certainly mine, um, but we have access to infinite intelligence. We are the infinite, infinite form. And even if we went through the torturous experience of learning lessons devised by the Board of Education and then pass through that tumultuous time of adolescence, which is often what happens to adolescents when they forget who and what they are and what they came for, all of it is retrievable. All of it is accessible. You give us the distillation of the incredible library of knowledge you have integrated into your being and share with everyone you encounter in ways that can exactly match the mirroring and the support that they need. So you truly are a colossus, and I share my huh. gift. And, and everyone has their own piece of the puzzle. And no matter whether one knows it now or not, or thinks it's significant or not, I, I once heard within myself that if I'm the, the triangle in the orchestra and I come in a moment too soon or too late, no one knows what wasn't present, but if I come in at the precise right moment, then everything is lifted to a higher frequency. So we're all like triangles, and some of us are big bassoons. I don't know, but anyway. <laughs> well, St. Thomas Aquinas said, if you asked a triangle to describe God, it would surely say he has three sides. Mm -hmm. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Shervine Jaffaria, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. 
I highly recommend you go to symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Shilaj minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their biocharge activated coconut charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their organic longevity formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis liposomal glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. I wrote a little something down on the paper while I was listening to you. Laurel is an English magician, also a physician, who shares her love without tuition. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and uh, a wonderful podcaster, Kara Mosher of Let's Be Friends, we did a podcast last week, and she introduced me as a musician, which will fit right in there. And she said, you play the symbols of the sounds of the consonants. And yeah. Mm-hmm. And so... Truly, yes. Thank you so much. One thing that I wanted to ask you just off the cuff is metaphor is is very important. I think particularly when you're dealing with concepts that are hard to describe with language. Um, I know from, from my studies and practices of spirituality and when I'm teaching, I find I can get points across to people so they can get an image through metaphor that they can't get if I come straight at it. But a lot of people don't really understand metaphor, I've found. They, 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 and, and they think some things are metaphors, but they're actually not metaphors. I was wondering if you could give us uh, a little short education on what a metaphor is and why they're important. Okay. I think part of the confusion may be that there's analogy, which means this is like that, and so we can understand it by that transference. Um, that's also called a simile when we have the like in it. And a metaphor is describing one thing in terms of another as if it were that. Right. It's like saying someone's worth their weight in gold. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good metaphor. Exactly. And So my quandary in my early 20s was, how do you close a metaphor in between the covers of a book? Because I realized that everything is metaphor. Our lives are metaphors for our beliefs. And so many of our pursuits are metaphors for our greater desire. So in the... um, Well, I think, for instance, that progress is a, a, what I call it, um, confounded metaphor for evolution. We have the evolutionary impulse within us. We don't know about, for the most part, we're not uh, instructed that this is an ongoing process like flowers bloom, you evolve, you become more aware, more fragrant, more hardy, et cetera, et cetera. So instead, there's progress. And progress is like a, a sacred word, a password. So when you see something of beauty and value destroyed for a high rise and sold it through the word progress. We have to make way for progress. It's not progress, it's destruction. And and so I have a poem, it's posted on YouTube, and it's called Metafortissimo. And and in it, there's a little line that says, I or stanza, I don't just write in metaphor, but meta five, six, seven, and eight. For that's how many layers it takes if one hopes to communicate a spectrum of reality in deep 
dimensionality. Yes, I love that. And I think that, um, I just think that our education system is very broken and, and, and all really everything we're talking about is the product of our education. And because the education system is really a, uh, a continuation of the plantation owners and the slaveholders, we're really in a corporate brainwashing system. And if you couple that with religion, you've really got a double bind. Absolutely. And a very intentional one. I believe that the reason it was so important that everyone believed the same thing or uh, on fear of torture and death is because of the power of mental energy. And when you have enough mental energy focused in the same direction, you can resurrect anything, which doesn't mean it's true. And so you bring up one of the most amazing synchronicities in terms of meeting a friend came when I was writing a story uh, at home, wanted a magical name for a little girl. I wanted it to be da-da-da. Da, 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 da. And so I was going, Christabel, Christabel, Christabel. And the phone rang and a woman said, hello, my name is Christabel. And I want to tell you about a sale at the body shop. And I said, Christabel, who are you? How did you get that name? And what are you doing with your life? So one of the things Christabel was doing was working with her best friend, a woman named Risa Brown. And Risa Brown is a homeschooling genius. She has done this for years. Her own kids were labeled dyslexic, dysgraphic, and disruptive. And she said, well, never mind. I'll educate them myself. And she and um, I think a, a cousin created a homeschool in a plumbing factory for their kids and the workers' kids. No homework, no tests, no grades, no pressure, but support at the in their areas of interest. And so her own sons weren't interested in reading till they were about 10 or so. The kids were then all ready for university level classes, emotionally and intellectually and socially, um, uh, in their areas of interest at the ages of 10, 11, and 12. So Buckminster Fuller says, you know, we're all born geniuses, but a genius is having a good mother. I don't know how many got that lucky. Um, uh, what is it? Charles Bukowski said, we're all, you know, we're, almost all of us are born geniuses and buried idiots. That is so intentional. And so I recommend you, Paul, and your family, if you haven't already, contact Risa Brown, R E S A. Brown. She lives in your neighborhood. She, uh, she helps parents help their children to become the Renaissance geniuses we are each born to be. And she has a website, passionorientededucation.com. And her first book is The Call to Brilliance. She's got at least nine books now. Genius, wonderful, loving mother who's helped so many kids actualize their potential. Yeah, I'll look into it. And and um, what we've been doing is uh, we had Mana in a in a Waldorf school, Steiner's school system. But they first they were going to let the kids come back to school. Then all of a sudden they sent a notice saying if you haven't been vaccinated, you have to wear a mask. So I'm like, uh, I'm not letting my son go to school and play that stupid game so uh what we did is we angie investigated and found a couple of very good steiner school teachers that don't want to be part of the system because of all that crap and so now we've got a lady that comes over and she brings a couple of kids two or three kids with her and then educates our kids here because we have everything they need here but i'll actually have angie look into that because i'd like to explore what the other options are, but I am very happy with the Waldorf school system. Well, it sounds like you're fully covered. So maybe, um, I mean, 
what a blessing for your children. And uh, that's every cloud has a silver lining and uh, the silver lining for your children and my grandchildren is liberation from the uh, factory-based education system. Yes. One of the things I wrote down a, a little while back and I forgot to share it with you is um, one of my favorite meditations that I do and I teach is called the Mu meditation. It's a Tibetan Buddhist meditation. And when I looked into it and, and did some research on what the reason for it is, I found something very interesting. It's because to them, the word Mu does not mean anything. So the meditation is simply this. If I'm leading the meditation, every time I say Mu, you say moo. If I go moo moo, you go moo moo. If I go moo 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 moo, you go moo 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 moo. But the point is, is that because there is no meaning to the word, your mind cannot lock onto it and, and take it in a direction. So what I do when I'm teaching the meditation to my students in classes or doing it in therapy or healing sessions is I actually am using the moo to keep their ego just engaged enough. So I start off moo, 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 and I keep the pace up. And then I slowly bring them into sort of a trance state because as they relax, they don't know when I'm going to say moo. So their mind stays in, in listening mode. So you see, if I change the pace and all of a sudden there's a bigger gap and a bigger gap, you just have this emptiness inside of you. And it's only good because if I said cow, your mind would keep on producing an image of a cow, you know? So because there's no meaning, it helps the mind get to this place of emptiness. And I think the fact that we have to have cultures inventing meditations that use words without meaning to get into meditation is saying something about our language and its inability to take us into spiritual depths. Well, um, you th thank you for that. That is amazing. So moo, to me, I hear a cow. I also see M-U. I think that was a prior civilization. So there is that. And when I, one of the early things I learned from my friend Jeffrey Armstrong is that Sanskrit has just about twice the number of letters in its alphabet that we do. And so when I heard that, I had the image of that's how we ran headlong into the looking glass and got stuck there so that everything is reflecting backward. And uh, Sanskrit has many, many more words to describe spiritual states of consciousness. We don't have the words. And in fact, one of the words I like to share that you would think we would have is omnif omniscient. No, no, no. Omniscient. Om no, omniscience no. is all knowing. No, it isn't that. Omnificent. So we know omniscient, all knowing. We know omnipresent, present everywhere. We know omnipotent, all powerful, all words that um, designate infinite intelligence beyond us. The word that design that is a capacity we all have. I've never met anyone who knew it, and the word is omnificent. O m n i f i c e n t, and it means possessing full creative power. Mm -hmm. I've read it in in many of my textbooks, and I've looked it up over the years. Um, but it's not a very commonly used word. No, it's mostly lost. We know of the words that relate to something so much larger than ourselves, but no one I've met knows the word related to our own capacity for creativity. And some people then say to me, but I'm not creative. And I respond that we've already demonstrated as a species that we have full destructive power. So the opposite has to be true. 
And now is time to recreate ourselves and consciousness on the planet be- while we c- can. Yeah. When people come to me in lots of trouble of various types, one of the things I tell them is, look, if you just invested the same amount of energy in creating what you do want that you have invested in creating what you don't want, you'll be free as a bird. It's just that you've been programmed through society and religion to have a negative orientation toward the use of your creative powers. And so all you've got to do is learn how to dream and manifest and keep your mind oriented toward what really brings you happiness and freedom as opposed to constantly thinking about you know what you're afraid of or what you don't want or how you know if you look good enough or what someone else is going to think about you and things like that well all that is true and as someone who has <laughs> been through so much psychic pain Um, and could not sufficiently extricate myself from it to be able to apply what I know about words, I I would imagine that among your audience are people who have also struggled with that. And when I started searching, the modalities for healing were not all that effective. So I simply want to add to that the importance of exposing ourselves to teachers, to processes, to practices, to prayers that will assist us in letting go of the heavy weight we've been dragging behind us that doesn't belong to us anyway. I listened to your wonderful podcast with Dr. Mark Woolin about the, the, the ancestral load, you know, it's like other people's baggage land on your head and you're supposed to find your way out of it. So um, <laughs> that, that's a prerequisite for being able to put in the full force of positive conviction in an affirmation. And I, I, I've had some wonderful tutoring in that by a a beautiful woman named Anne Selby. And she and Peter Selby have youangelyou.com. And Anne is so good at having managed her, her, um, reached a state where she is pretty steady at a high level of composure. And one of the affirmations that she shared with me is, I declare divine order. Everything works out more exquisitely than I plan. And that has helped me a lot get out of places where the impulse to implode is strong and yet I speak that until I believe it. And um, and my goodness, the results are amazing. Yes. And, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to share you with the audience today is to help awaken us. And every time I talk to you, I get more awakened. It's like, okay, wow, I can reorient my mind that way. I can I I can be more careful about the words I use. I can look more carefully into the meaning, you know, so it's, it's kind of like a quickening. I think you give us a quickening. Um, You know, you can't teach somebody that's not ready to grow up anything. They have to be ready. And I think we're at a, a place now in the world where people are are probably more aware than ever that whatever we're doing, it's just not working. And no matter how much money we spend, we're usually spending it to be more destructive instead of more holistic and more creative. So I actually feel that, that your time, Laurel, is now. I really do. Thank you so much. And thank you for letting me address your audience. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. And yes, this is the moment for the note I sound on my particular triangle. And when you use the word we mean, what words mean, I have a little blog called the mean meaning of mean. And it points out that means me, uh, I'm going to read it, mean means 
many things in addition to intention and signification. It also means offensive, selfish, nasty, small-minded, ignoble, stingy, inferior in quality, of little importance, bad-tempered, in poor condition, shabby, and average. Yeah, see, there you go. How's that for a paradox? Right. And then definition, we are deafened by our definitions. We don't hear it, so we're not of sound mind. I mean, even the word atmosphere, I heard early on, at most fear. So no wonder I have oh, a nervous, yes. no wonder I have a nervous system. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It's amazing, you know, when I start listening to you, I can pick up, I start becoming more aware of the syllables and finding the words in the words. And it's like, there's a lot of shit sneaking right under the radar out there. Oh, it's everywhere. But, and there's also what I call sacred path words. And if you think again of the English language as a uh, sound system, an echo chamber and hall of mirrors, the words are constantly bouncing all over the place. So there, and words convert, words emerge at the convergence of consciousness and culture. So you have some words that echo and reflect the culture and some that reflect back our genius to us. So the most, I mean, one of the most wonderful ones is the fact that earth and heart are composed of identical letters. The only difference is the placement of the letter H. So ask a child what might be the significance. If we're not dismissing it all as coincidence, which is a word that simply says coincidence, but it also connotes insignificance. But why not look at what that coincidence has to say to us? So I've asked children, and I remember one little boy said, well, uh, I said, what is it? What do you think? The earth heart, uh, as one word, really is. And he said, well, maybe it's because the earth is the heart of the solar system. And another child said, well, the earth is the heart of our lives. And ask anyone, you'll get a beautiful answer. And it's one of the reasons I like to say that my word magic wordplay turns youngsters into punsters and punsters into pundits. Mm. So when I was growing up, much more so than today, puns were still called the lowest form of humor. And in other words, even though the, the master punsters were Shakespeare and James Joyce, noticing that a word has congruence is a joke. Don't take it seriously. So people don't listen and they don't hear. And I had the opportunity to spend time with my wonderful webmaster, Shane Dieter of Dieter Designs, um, a year or two ago. And I was for a little while um, listening to his four-year-old's video game. And there was the narration that was repeated was nothing going on over here. Let's look elsewhere. Nothing going on over here. Let's look elsewhere. So implanting in that child's mind to overlook the obvious. And the word, so we are oblivious to the obvious. Um, Sherlock Holmes said the world is full of obvious things that nobody happens to notice. Well, here is a four-year-old getting entrained in his subconscious mind to ignore the, the data from his own senses. And we have the word, so we are oblivious to the obvious. And the only difference between those two words is L-I, lie. Wow. Yeah. Amazing stuff. You know, turmeric's really, really hot now. There's a lot of scientific research on it. 
but they're not all created the same. So I brought Autumn Smith on to tell you about Paleo Valley's turmeric complex so you know exactly what the benefits are and why you, like me, should get your turmeric complex from Paleo Valley. Autumn, tell us about your turmeric complex. At Paleo Valley, we are big believers in food as medicine. And so turmeric, of course, it has beat drugs out. We know it's anti-inflammatory. We know it has brain benefits. We know it has joint benefits. But what most people don't know is that a lot of turmeric supplements only contain one isolated compound of turmeric called curcumin. And so what we did instead was create a complex. We added organic turmeric and then ginger and rosemary and clove, which were some of the most DNA protective spices studied. And we created a complex. We added organic coconut powder and pepper for absorption. And so we We've created a really high quality, highly bioavailable turmeric complex that will hopefully help you to feel your best. And all you have to do to check it out is go to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K-15, to save 15%. Well, Laurel, I'm finding this more than fascinating and it's It's also healing for me because it helps me feel better about my childhood experiences and my reason, reason for leaving school. I, you know, as you know, I only did the ninth grade and and then I found that I wasn't gaining anything. It wasn't helping me see how I could do anything in the real world. And so here I am a 60 year old man speaking to you way down the line, but, but hearing that my intuition as a young, what would I be 14 or 15, 15 year old in the ninth grade? Uh, I started the first three months of the 10th grade and I just said, I just can't take this anymore. And I just said, I've got to go do something that mean is meaningful to me, not just to meet other people's approval. I already know how to balance a checkbook. I know the basics of physics and what gravity is. I can, you know, I can make a living right now. I don't need to hear more of this, you know, stuff. Uh, so thank you for, for the uh, confirmation that my own inner guidance system was working as a child. And then you wanted to share... Uh, the rest of the poem that you shared earlier. Is that correct? Yes. Um, the piece that came after the one I began at the at uh, the beginning of our conversation. Please do. I, I would love to hear it. Thank you. And, and it just kind of brings the conversation back to uh, where we began. And that goes idiom, tedium, podium, odium, word weary and spellbound. Those who believe that our language is humdrum have never considered this awesome conundrum. If the word made the world and our world is in anguish, must be time to get free from the spells of our language. For how can we start fresh in this grand new millennium when the words that we use foster disequilibrium? Many rattle our minds with puns, symbols, and rhymes that openly echo the old paradigms. And yet few people notice, for here's what I've found. We use volumes of words, yet are deaf to their sound. And though sound means integrity, strength, and solidity, we act as if word sounds had no such validity. Well, now that English sounds abound around the world, it is essential to explore their hidden metaphor, to utilize their full potential. We must repair dualities, for all of these are influential in splitting personalities and making us irreverential. All language is magic, so its spells can be tragic or mystical. 
and the keys to deciphering its secrets are mystalinguistical. Yet they're also accessible at a reasonable decibel. So, if you like to play with words and don't think puns are for the birds, then take this flight of fancy now just on a lark. She'll show you how to rise above the standard attitude until you reach that grander latitude that helps one see the alchemy that's conjured up by A, B, C. Mm. There's so much truth in there. It's uh, If that book was held to my heart, I would buy it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the poem that follows... Uh, that one is called Esoterica by Laurel Erica, the definitive exegesis on the letter S in verse. And that is going to be an, uh, available soon as an animation with a wonderful artist from, from Turkey named, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, but it's on the credit. And then the voice artist is also from Turkey, Arkin Selik. And um, all that information will be there. It will show that though we have looked upon the alphabet as meaningless symbols for meaningless sounds, actually, we know that sound that uh, symbols are the language of the unconscious. But we've so uh, made ourselves unconscious to the most significant set of symbols on the planet. And with esoterica, I will be distinct. <laughs> deconstructing a lot of um, gospel related to the snake and the serpent and um, showing that the alphabet is code, it re reflects us, it echoes us, and we can start designing anew as well as part of the New English Reformation. <laughs> Yeah, you know, listening to you talk reminds me of Leonard Schlein's work on the alphabet and the goddess and the effects that the alphabet has on our brains and pushing us into our left brains. And uh, well, we're, we're, Leonard and I were friends at the time that he was writing that book, and I got to read it in manuscript form. And I think he was possibly the first person I shared esoterica with. And he said, I don't know why people aren't paying you millions of dollars for your work. So we also had- oh, Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Well, I'm open and ready and have lots of good places to put it and share it. And I had an ordination with as a wish fairy when I was with Leonard. I have a little article about it. Um, an amazing- man. And because I didn't grow up knowing I was intelligent, yet I somehow magnetically attracted people like you with this enormous intelligence and then would feel so much less than uh, Leonard's validation of me saying he'd had more aha experiences with me than anyone in a very long time. Let me know that I was smart. I did not, even though i I, I do really well in school, but I did it without effort. And so it was not appreciated when I was growing up. So I, anyway, I say these things in part to say that most of us grow up feeling inadequate because we're off center with our true self, which is the source of our power. And by being off center, we're constantly wobbling and we are, can fall prey to addictive substances that are looking to, or that are uh, supposed to give us what it is, who it is we already are and nothing can. And you can never get enough of that which cannot satisfy. So I share that I didn't know I was smart. Uh, or anything like that. And Leonard helped validate my own intelligence. And so, yes, that book is very meaningful to me. And I, I was very persuaded by his argument. Yeah, it's a powerful one. And I think it's one that should be uh, taken very seriously by anybody who has an academic institution and wants to produce healthy, productive, creative people instead of robots. 
the, there's a couple of things I wanted to bring up that weren't really in my plan, but I feel uh, inspired to talk to you briefly about them. One, you've mentioned we were talking about echo and reflection and how when you hear a sound, you would talk about how it would bounce around in you. And so it brought me back to my study of Steiner's teachings on the soul. And Steiner says something about the soul that's very interesting. He says anything with an inside and an outside has a soul. Even an atom, because an atom is the smallest unit of matter, and therefore it has to, you know, if matter did not have some form of intelligence, it could not maintain its form. And that each thing in nature has the level of intelligence that's ideal for its function in nature. So stones have stone intelligence because if stones had human intelligence, they would say, I'm tired of carrying the weight of this house. Screw it. I'm going to become something else and your house would fall down. If trees didn't want to be trees, then we'd all be in trouble. But the interesting thing is that Steiner also talks about when it comes to eating meat, and I'm, I'm leading to a point here, so it might seem like I'm going sideways, but I'm not. Steiner talks about because he, he wanted people to be vegetarians, but he also said exactly what Yogananda said, and both of them have been terribly, terribly misunderstood and, and, and misrepresented. But both Steiner and Yogananda said nobody should become a vegetarian until it, it can be done naturally. They should not force themselves to be a vegetarian. And unfortunately, Waldorf schools and um, a lot of the uh, people that are in self-realization fellowship kind of push this vegetarian agenda on people that really should not be eating that way because of this misunderstanding. But what Steiner taught in regard to why he felt it was important to grow yourself spiritually to the point that your vibration was high enough that you didn't need to eat meat was he said that the more membranes that there is in any living creature the more conscious the soul is because the vibration of the cosmos hits those membranes and reverberates. It echoes inside of the body. And so if you, for example, dissect a cow, you're going to find that even in one piece of muscle, there's layers and layers and layers of membranes. You know, you, if you dissect one muscle fiber, there could be a thousand fibrils each wrapped in its own fascial membrane. So if you think of the soul like a drum, if you hit the drum, it resonates. There's an echo because the vibration hits one side, bounces back, hits the other side, or, the, or if it's a single-sided drum, it resonates within the cavity of the drum. Therefore, if you eat the animal, you're eating something that's catching cosmic vibrations, but it's being, the vibrations are being converted into the signals that orient themselves to the DNA of that creature. In other words, if you're eating beef, you're bringing a lot of beef consciousness and beef soul into you. And that relates to people behaving in ways that are less than human because they don't realize that they're bringing in the soul of something that has got a horizontal spine and it's oriented towards instincts and drives, not conscious creativity. So it actually has a, a retarding effect on our consciousness. And I, my soul led me into being a vegetarian for a year. And I noticed within two weeks that my clairvoyance was much stronger, that my intuitive reach was stronger that my capacity to read energy fields and feel subtle vibrations was very, very good. Now, it was not easy for me to do because my, my body and my genetics need meat. So after one year to the day, my soul said, you can go ahead and eat fish and eggs now. And then six months later, you could eat meat and just go back to your rotation diet. So I was able to go through this journey and I lost 24 pounds of muscle and I got to the point where I was starving to death. But I learned a lot, and, and it gave me a real appreciation for why Steiner and Yogananda wanted people to 
grow into vegetarianism. So this is the setup to say that our soul is what has the experience. Spirit is what's delivering the energy and the information. So I tell my students, if you want to know how to describe soul and spirit in metaphor, most of you have played a drum like a shaman's drum. It is the vibration and the experience of the sound that equates to soul, but it's you hitting the drum with the stick that is the energy and information giving the soul something to experience. So the spirit is what's bringing the experience, but the soul is what's having the experience. Now that I've set the stage, what I'm saying is everything you're teaching us is saying that words are sound and vibration. And when we speak or when we listen, even our ear drum is in vibration. So we're actually in a state of soul speak. We're creating inner experiences that are deep within the very depth of us, the soul of us. And if the words that we're using are bringing the soul into experiences that do not liberate it or do not access the genius that's in all of us or access our creativity, then we, don't, we may not realize that a lot of our anxiety and depression is coming from the fact that the soul is being enslaved by these words and these vibrations. And so that, I just wanted to share my thoughts on that and see how that resonated with you. Well, thank you. Um, let me just take that in for a moment in my heart. It was so beautiful and eloquent and authentic. So what came up first for me was something I read years ago by a man who had had like you, a very early soul travel experience. His was a near-death experience. And after his communication with the beings who helped him, um, that's all he wanted. And so he got a lot of tutoring from higher dimensional consciousness. And I bring that up simply because the one thing I remember that he was, <coughs> excuse me, taught was that every cell has a soul and that they come together and then they call in that, that higher soul that we are to embody in this instrument. And so the idea that each one has a soul and every little cell in me can become awake and alive and vibrating at a high frequency and resonating in ways that then I become a tuning fork <laughs> for higher energies for other people. I mean, there's nothing I can imagine that feels better than that. And so that's one thing I wanted to say in terms of uh, how we treat ourselves as we speak. I wrote a piece a couple of years ago or three years ago. I was interviewed by a beautiful man known as Truth Sika. And in addition to his podcast, he also is a musician composer. And he was doing a series of songs around the chakras and invited me to do a minute of verse for his piece on the throat chakra. And that's when I created Speaking Beauty, which I believe is an anthem for our era. And it's not long, and here or elsewhere, I can share it. Go ahead. Um, okay. So contrast it with the idea that we shoot off our mouths, that we make cutting remarks, that we trash talk. And while it's it may certainly impact others, it's impacting us as well, and impacting in the sense of, you know, um, contracting and, and keeping the spaciousness that is where the source of connection with the infinite is out of our reach because of what we've got on our mouth. So <clears throat> here is speaking beauty. We are godlings on this planet here because we all pre-planned it. Ghastly, ghostly shadows, damn it, now's our chance to superman it. 
Oh my goodness. Speak your peace now, re-enchant it. Freedom's codes are all semantic. Though we're small and sometimes frantic, souls are whole and all gigantic. These may be our darkest hours, yet each of us has superpowers. The infinite is infinite, which means we can turn on the light. All life's a dream, and we're the dreamers. Though hate streaming through the schemers, we're all here as world redeemers, beaming peace, we're love supremers. So mages, sorceresses, sages, artists of all sorts and ages, share your gifts now. Be courageous. Daring actions are contagious. A diamond mind and heart of gold are gifts, the prophecies foretold for those uniting souls on earth by honoring each being's full worth. When we let go of againstness, we step into our immenseness for the genesis of genius is the light we strike between us when we share the gifts with which we're blessed to inspire higher consciousness. Then we'll gain what we've been dreaming of, the gift of everlasting love, the bliss of everlasting love, the kiss of everlasting love. Yeah, beautiful. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to announce that one of my favorite companies in the world, Bioptimizers, has a brand new amazing product called Blood Sugar Breakthrough. And boy, is that needed. Wade, I wanted you to come on and tell us how your new product works. Well, basically, we've combined a wide variety of products that help manage blood sugar and help dispose glucose into your muscle tissues as opposed into your fat tissues. And basically, by improving your insulin sensitivity and depositing sugar in a way that enhances your health, you will be able to have better workouts, better lean body mass gains, get leaner more easy, and have that more steady blood sugar rate without the rises and dips, which is associated with you know blood sugar poor management. That's excellent. What's the discount for Living 4D listeners and where do they get it? Well, if you go to bloodsugarbreakthrough.health slash living4d and put in Paul 10, you'll get a 10% discount. And if it doesn't impress you better than any other blood sugar product you've ever tried, you get 100% of your money back. Hey, that's a no risk purchase for an amazing product. And believe me, my track record with Bioptimizer's products is 100% satisfaction. Never had anybody complain to me, and I highly doubt you will, but I'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you, Wade. I'm excited about the new product. You know, the joy of hearing you speak is the joy of realizing that we each have to choose to take the lid off the box that we've been programmed into. But the the other side of the coin on that for me is I don't really get the sense that we have a lot of time before we cripple nature or lead ourselves into some kind of a a very serious uh, disaster due to the uh, direction that we're all heading in our unconsciousness. How, Laurel, do you perceive we can collectively awaken to our possibility before? I mean, because you're talking about 7 billion people that are stuck in this sort of dysfunctional language, dysfunctional education, orienting toward the negative you know, dot, 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 what's, what do you feel is the way out from your perspective as a linguistic expert? Well, um, that's a perfect setup. If you want to hear my word magic global anthem, which is called taking command of the English language. Let's do it. 
Okay. Let me just call it up on a screen. I have it on memory, but um, I want to make sure I've got it all. Yeah, that's no problem. Thank you. I'm I'm kind of mind blown how many poems you can remember. My God, you're when they when when some alien looks inside of your head, they're going to think they've found the uh, tr- world's treasure of poetry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I appreciate that. So here's taking command of the English language. All of us are instruments of powerful forces and of divine resources of which we have only the barest, if any, awareness. And language as the conveyor of culture and creation is one such force, yet its course responds to our own dictation, and many lives have been transformed through optimistic affirmations. So though the mystery of the word is beyond our ken, its power rests upon the tongue of almost every human citizen on planet Earth. This means that we collectively can give the English language new life through rebirth with high intention and heightened sensitivity to the electrifying activity of creative intelligence, we can amplify our receptivity to an airborne language of elevating metaphors and trans... Okay, I've got to find that. Uh, And... An airborne language of elevating words and emancipating metaphor, never as yet heard before, that will enable us to write anew our genesis. As these uplifting words and metaphors emerge, each succulent syllable may well coalesce to express new combinations of sounds and scents that urge an end to dissension and turn a life once rife with strife into the fulfillment of God's highest intention. For as we flow this sanguine language into this dimension, our every word and phrase will begin to take flesh and to manifest into a grand new world of our own awakened heart's sublime invention. I think back about how random acts of kindness help deliver us from our blindness and remind us of the sweetness that binds, refines, and completes us through our acts of spontaneous, miscellaneous giving and how these acts simultaneously elevate our own standards for what we call really living Since generosity generates prosperity, when we give with an open heart and true sincerity, the perfection of strangers expressing affection in every direction began with the collection of a few choice words that suddenly occurred to a single individual and then uh, was share, let's see, suddenly occurred to a single individual and then stirred all others who heard it. To be the one to release the dove of peace on a wave of love that lifts us all above our usual sense of separation must surely be the cause for an ongoing celebration, for it is certainly an experience that lifts us well beyond words and beyond anything money could possibly buy. And yet it is free for all who wish to glorify God's living presence as our human essence and thus to bless the rest and thus to bless the best in the rest of us. I obviously should have practiced this. 
It's free for all who wish to glorify God's living presence as our human essence and thus to bless the best in the rest of us. But speaking of money, have you heard the exhilarating word torbillion? It means something resembling a whirlwind or a firework that rises spirally. Ideally, we all could be tour billionaires with whirls of words that swirl the world's next revolution. And with a zillion vermilion turbillions of word fire, we could inspire higher consciousness and grant our own absolution, both through updated adages and divine locution that blows the mind free of its slavery to the inherent blasphemy that still thunders through the language and now threatens to drag us under toward an ever more miserable yet totally unnecessary destiny. For though so few of us will ever win the lottery, every one of us could be the conduit for a lot of exotic vocabulary and for catalytic mottos that turn on the world. Can you even begin to imagine the cosmic voltage that will be released through our collective pyrotechnic linguistic revoltage. We could just about instantly blow out the circuitry on lies and hypocrisy. So we might not yet need to hold the keys to the halls of power because the word it is believed by many cultures sparked the big bang. And since English is the language that's rebuilding Babel's tower at this way past 11th hour, we can unite to write life sentences that will not boomerang, but will parole our souls from serving terms that sentence us to limitation and that cause us to forget we've got the power of all creation in the consciousness we hold and on the tip of every tongue. So since most prophecies of old foretell a golden age that soon could come. We can begin to set the stage and to reduce the world's afflictions by speak in, speaking out in healing words that can fulfill divine predictions. For the word is known to have more lasting impact than the sword. And we're created in the image and the likeness of the Lord. So it must be our divine assignment to help promote world realignment through a retuning of our language that brings hearts into accord. Wow. Yeah, that's a, it's a powerful message for sure. You know, there's so much in there. And one of the challenges with a uh, delivery like that, uh, Laurel, is that any one of those sentences could throw you into meditation. And so I find myself listening to you, but I also have to keep reining myself in because you're tickling my soul. And all of a sudden I'm dreaming about how could I apply this, just this one statement she just made. And then there's another one and another one. So uh, what I would like you to do is, can you just repackage that into one or two sentences that tell us what is it that we can do together now with language? Right. Become inventive, become aware Look at what words, listen to words as well as look at them. See what might be inside them. Turn, I call it turning them inside out and backward. And one of 
what I believe is the ultimate backward. Well, that really des- deserves a better preface than just that. Um, I have a blog, likely on my website, Word Magic Global, called Is Western Civilization Dyslexic? And it has a wonderful quote in it about when the uh, Christians came to power, everything, uh, you know, in the British Isles, everything that was uh, important to the Anglo-Saxon was considered heathen and was reversed 180 degrees. And it, and it said, this affects everything, including the English language you speak today. So time to tune up the language, time to hold the intention to download from our universal heart drive new words, new metaphors, new symbols and sounds that that resonate within your own being, that give you exquisite sensations and share them. I have a vision for doing this collectively as a uh, as word magic's literary lotto where people can send in a download with a few dollars and um we a, a team of people who who plays with them evaluates them we can have what one of the people who came to a word magic class called a thesaurus of ascension and we can also market phrases of the caliber of random acts of kindness so that people all over the world are seeking to hear their inner calling the the, the beauty in their own heart and to and I am very sure that word that reality downloads in its own language and if you carry a pad with you or you're a little recorder and you write these down we can have many more of random acts of kindness that change behavior worldwide and one of the things um well a couple anyway so that's one thing and If there are people out there who'd like to work with me to help bring this vision into reality, part of the vision is that the prophet who brings through a beautiful phrase, a tuning up of the language, that that we then market it and they profit from their genius so that everyone is cultivating the capacity for inner listening, starting with, you know, like once I was walking in a park and I said to my invisible friends, give me a new word. And I instantly heard the true, the true intention behind the word beautiful. And it is be you too full. There's nothing more exquisite than our authentic self-expression as a collection of souls from the infinite and an instrument through which the divine can embody and express in unique ways that serve the common wealth uh, that we share together. And I can keep going, Paul, so you have to jump in. Well, wait a minute, don't jump yet. Um, What you were talking about, too many words, and it puts you in a meditative state. I once had a recognition that it must be possible to so orchestrate light light and sound that it creates a flicker frequency and that while the intellect is engaged with the story and the words as i have in my poem word fire um i, I talk about uh the the flicker frequency that that awaken soul identity memories that reunite the divine and the mortal aligned as its portal so spirit can enter and bring us to center so it's not necessary to catch every word i mean this is this is how I have been you know how it's been unfolding through me it's not for catch every word. It's have the experience. Know that there's the flicker frequency that is very resonant with soul identity, as well as wherever your mind desires to go and explore and take pieces of and let each one open up something new beyond what was in my mind when those words came through. 
Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, one, well, one thing came through specifically, and then there's another point I wanted to get back to with you because I'm curious about your thoughts on it. But thoughts and words are sort of like, you know, the recycle symbol with the three twisted arrows feeding each other? Yes. You see, when we're children, we don't have words. We, I think we, we do have thoughts because we see things and we want them before we have thoughts. And we, we have this, you know, having little kids, I watch them and I see that they're, they're conscious, but it's as though they don't know how to express their consciousness. And so one of the sort of double-edged swords is that the words that we're programmed with ultimately become the basis by which we organize our thoughts and thought energy is extremely powerful. It's thought energy that leads to most words. In fact, creation unfolds from thought to word to deed. So it seems that if you see, when you see with all the depression in the world and all the anxiety in the world, you have to wonder how much of that is the thoughts that are, are the reverberations of the words that are being used constantly, not only to communicate outside of yourself, but the inner dialogue. You know, one of the things that Steiner taught anthroposophic physicians is that whenever somebody comes to you with any kind of a chronic illness or disease, you must identify their secret story. Because mm -hmm. therein is the doorway to what's actually causing the disease. The point being is that if the secret story is I'm not loved or nobody wants me or I'm not good enough, those are all words that are not only creating thoughts, but thoughts that are creating mm -hmm. words. So it's sort of interesting because if we use the right words like love or blessing or things that have a positive vibration, then they naturally stimulate thoughts that resonate with that. So what I'm saying is we're kind of in this interesting situation because thoughts make words and words make thoughts. And if our words that we start with produce thoughts that are not healing or connecting, then we just spiral down into some kind of a, 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 a degenerative situation but if our words that we're using spiral into thoughts that are progenitive, creative, then we we spiral up and we grow and we expand and then we we feel more connected and more whole. So it's it's it really I think takes somebody like you to teach us, which brings up a a, a point like. If you have people that are stuck in depression, anxiety, or maybe their life's not working out the way they dreamed it would, are there what you might call healing words that a person could use as a chant or a mantra to, to create a resonance that opens the soul? Well, uh, Jeffrey Armstrong can supply you with quite a few in Sanskrit, and he talks about the Sanskrit language as vibrational vitamins, because you're actually, with those sounds, you're actually accessing the higher dimensional consciousness that you are, that is encapsulated in the mantra. In English, um, that, that mantra that I received from Ann Selby, I declare divine order, everything works out more exquisitely than I plan. That has helped me enormously because my language, as much as I know, I have in the past been uh, not as careful and conscious as I could be. So Ann has been very helpful. So Words that make your heart sing. And sometimes when I'm in a meditative state, words just come to me. And, and I just write it down like beauty, beauty, love and beauty, higher octaves flowing through me, whatever. I, I don't have that memorized, but it's like, yes, I, I've been listening to gong music while meditating recently and letting the words cycle through me of of 
um, infinite compassion, innate harmony. There's a four that I got from a Dr. Marie Chiasson, I think, on YouTube. And I just expand from there. It's like I'm tuning myself up like I'm I, I'm the gong as I speak. So my words are singing to the hearts of listeners and myself being the first and foremost listener. And it's a way I have of soothing my soul and bringing myself back to myself. And in terms of thoughts, right there in the heart of the word is oughts. So thoughts immediately contains shoulds. And I, I have a poem I, I don't know by heart, but it's in that little black book, Word Magic, Word Play, uh, that puts a new spin on the world. And it's called Putting the Source Before Descartes. And maybe I'll, I'll just read a little bit. Um, uh, there's just circumstantial evidence for reality. Physicists doubt it exists in actuality, which means that matter, though it's seen, can disappear as in a dream because it ultimately lacks substantiality. We may dis describe what can't be sensed as utter nonsense, dismissing the ethereal as wholly immaterial, but more than matter matters and has consequence, for in truth the incorporeal is very likely more real. As the factual is rarely actual since the real is not really real. It's our beliefs that form motifs round which recurrent thoughts congeal. The uh, And anyway, it goes on. It talks about from think to thing. It's just a letter difference. And you were talking about um, the the cycle of thoughts and what what also happens is they activate feelings and it is the emotion that empowers our mental creations to have the energy necessary to come into manifestation as the essential hallucination that they begin with. Mm -hmm. And so we are in an, an extremely dangerous time and time in my mind to put our our conditioned faith in the power of the word to the ultimate test by seeing what would happen in our individual lives, in our interactions with others, and globally. If more and more people start looking for, start inventing new language, like the geniuses you spoke of, because there aren't in English words that have the capacity for you to convey, for instance, the amazing journeys that you've experienced, Paul. It, it, and Sanskrit has a much better vocabulary for that. I mean, a, a not even much better. That is condemned with faint praise. It has the language, and Jeffrey Armstrong is putting out lots of books that will introduce us to more of these words and let us know the Sanskrit origin of a lot of English words so that we can start evoking these vibrational vitamins to feed our those souls in each cell the nutrients they need to thrive so that the instrument we are can endure through all the challenges we're collectively facing right now. Yes. Now, we're, we're pretty late in the show, so there's a couple things I want to hit before we say goodbye. Um, one of the things you say, which I know is fully true, is that he who tells the stories of a culture really governs human behavior. And then we have this long... quotation. It's not original. So just that, That's say. okay. It's just making a point, and it's a true statement. And anybody that's an expert at marketing knows exactly the truth of that. That's the basis of marketing for better or worse. Um, so when you look back at the church as the source of what you describe as a linguistic mindfuck um, and the secret spells of the English language, 
you know, if you study the Vatican, they've got their hands in everything, probably got their hands in what's going on in the world right now. Um, they had brainwashing mastered by the 8th century AD, according to the research I've done, and they've been perfecting it ever since. What, what did you find in this investigation into the church, and how does that relate to the situation that we're in now? Well, what a setup for <laughs> another poem. I had a dream once where I was... Um, rushing to uh, attend a class on the biblical origins of the English language. And I ran up the, the steps of this wooden tower and found I was the only student there. Now, that was years ago. I haven't studied it in depth. But um, in, in one of my, in my ferriography, and my fairy self says it was hard to believe that both Adam and Eve were so wholly naive to the serpent's seduction that without hesitation they fell to temptation, which was the causation for Eden's destruction. Then I learned that in Latin, a word pronounced malum means apple and evil, which explained the upheaval. The world was undone by original pun, so that life became punishment rather than fun. Wow. So, so that's just a little snippet. But let me now, you've given me an introduction for my vision statement, which is, that in all our efforts to heal our psyches and raise consciousness on the planet, we've all but overlooked the very instrument of conscious thought and communication. Yet our forked tongue English language, which is the leading software of the Western mind, is itself in great need of retuning and upgrading. Over the course of my life, I have cultivated a heightened sensitivity to how the total normality of insanity in society is echoed, reflected, and reinforced by the English language, which has an antiquated and manipulated vision of reality promulgated by the church as an instrument of mind control at a time when people had to surrender their minds if they wanted to keep their heads about them quite literally. So if we elect collectively to upgrade the English language to a higher frequency through our linguistic creativity and naturally occurring verbal eccentricities, then ultimately even clatter from our idle chatter, prattle patter, blabber blather and palaver as we jabber gab and Babylon will turn our glowing terms from verbal vapor either hanging in the air or trapped on paper, into tiny bits of shiny matter as we gather, chat, and natter on, and with new skill at trilling, thrilling statements that instill fulfilling imagery of higher possibilities, will finally flip the switch, enlightening every con every circuit of our consciousness with the electric surge of verbiage that encourages superb and selfless services to spread from soul to soul around the globe by what is said in all the light years up ahead. And then from the islands of silence between all that spoken, we will listen as doors to the heartland spring open. That's great. Yeah. There's, again, there's so much in there. Hi, everybody. Do you guys want to know one of my secret weapons that helps me avoid being sick or feeling run down? It's Organifi Immunity. Organifi Immunity is a super high quality certified organic drink mix that provides daily immune support and supports overall immunity. Organifi Immunity contains whole food vitamins C and D, whole food zinc, mushroom beta glycans, and provides only natural sweetness. Not only will you support your immune system, but you'll also get 
on-the-go superfoods in a delicious orange blend that is great for you and your kids and everyone will love it. My family and I love it, and it's easy as tearing off the top of the package and mixing it with high-quality drinking water, and you can rest a little easier knowing that you're enhancing your immune system, which is probably a good idea now that so many people are spending so much time indoors, breathing indoor air, and lacking sun exposure. Why not enjoy a little immune insurance while getting certified organic nutrients, superfoods, and great taste that's quick, easy, and effective? To get your Organifi immunity and shop their amazing product line with your Living 4D discount, Go to O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com and save 20% on any and all of their products using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's check 20 during checkout. Enjoy Organifi. You know, one of the things about your poetry is it's so deep and it has so many dimensions to it that I wish I had it written down because then I could go a verse at a time and let it take me where it wants to take me. Um, I find what I have to do when I'm listening to you is I have to try to not understand what you're saying because then I get stuck in trying to go into the understanding and I lose the, the ride so I find like when I had Ari Hanovar on the show, the, the famous Rumi poet, um, she spoke in um, Farsi. So I couldn't understand, but I could really feel the poetry profoundly. You know, it was very strong. The, the, you know, the, the, because of the Farsi language, which is what Rumi spoke. And so I find with you that it's better for me not to try to process the meaning, but to have the experience Um, so this time I would like to ask you a question that I, that you don't answer with a poem because I really want to hear this at the (laughs) rational level. All right. With your knowledge of words and spell casting, what do you see going on in the world right now, directly related to all the issues of COVID and loss of freedoms and censorship? and loss of our rights, our sovereignty, and the many long list of very unpleasant, uh, disgusting things that are going on. I mean, using your knowledge and skill, if you analyze this, what do you see happening? Oh, thank you for that question. So I look at the, um, the possibility of 5D energies downloading to us, that there is that spiritual abilities and consciousness are more accessible than they ever were before. This is the time. So at the same time that there is this this marriage of heaven on earth in our own beingness possible, the 5D, there is an attempt to counter it with 5G so that um, our resources and our access are contain, uh, contained. Similarly, as Bruce Lipton has said, our next evolution as a species is to become a superorganism. Examples we have of superorganisms are ants, where everything is working together. But imagine if each of us were accessing, which is more possible now than ever, our divine resources, our capacities to self-actualize the gifts within us that we may not even yet know exist. But holding the intention, um, there's a wonderful word that's hardly known. People know the idea of actualizing your potential, but don't know there's a word for that, which is entelechy, E-N-T-E-L-E-C-H-Y. And what that also means is the, that self-actualizing energy within us. So it what turns um, an acorn into an oak. Yeah, it's a locus of intelligence. Yes, exactly. And so that is at work in us. And we are, there is that impulse to unite as a super organism where each person is contributing their highest and the best. And what the 
whoever is behind this insanity is doing with the impulse toward unity is trying to uh, do it on the level of ants, where we're monitored by drones and must obey a techno queen. And, and similarly, the recognition that language needs to be evolved, that's going in some pretty peculiar directions as far as I can see and hear and say. It as, um, so these three impulses to access our higher intelligence, actualize our greater potential, unify with other people to become a super organism. We're eight billion against whoever, however many little billionaires are trying to control us like ants and consciously, intentionally evolve the language to inspire the best instead of the beast in each other. So I see that I see this convergence point and I, I, I believe everyone alive today is here because we're here by divine appointment because what we have to offer is a transcendent capacity that we can access as we speak and write. And through all the healing modalities, we're drawn to uh, explore, to let go of that load of crap that we've that's been conditioned to us and that was downloaded on us from the beginning. Doesn't matter because who we are uh, as beings in spirit is greater than anything that ever occurred to us. That part of us that is divine is alive or we wouldn't be here. And it's seeking to ex embody and express more fully in the face of everything we're, encouraged, we're encountering which can be looked upon as catalytic. And I remember the scene in Wonder Woman where um, she was having a, a contest with her teacher and was losing it. And people were saying, you're more than this, you're more than this. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, an energy burst from her bracelet or her wrists or something. We would not have we need the catalyst like that breaks open the shell of the acorn so that the oak can get its start. The, the, there's a tremendous concerted push to keep us from coming online with the divine as a fully actualized and activated collective entity. So that's what I that's what I hold in my heart, and I just continue playing with words because it has been the greatest uh, painkiller <laughs> I've ever found in this life and direct enlightener. Yes. It's also very interesting what you've just shared because Steiner, in many of my Steiner books, warned that in he wrote this you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, somewhere between... 1895 and uh, probably about 1920, but he talked about how in the future vaccinations would be given that would kill the soul and turn us into robotic machines. Into, he basically said into machines that would be controlled by an external source and that we would if we fell for it, we would lose our spirituality and fall back into the realm of Aramon, which is the force guiding matter. You sent me that powerful quote, and I've shared it widely. And I look at the fact that the word I, uh, identity, which should be sacrosanct, our unique identity, is nearly identical with the word identical. And similarly, autonomous, being uh, self-sourced and free, is nearly identical with the word automaton. So I feel like, you know, what's his name? Trump let it slip when he said herd mentality instead of herd immunity. That's what all the spin doctors are seeking to create. And look at the word herd, H-E-R-D, and add an A in the middle of it. We are herded by what we hear. 
and turned into a herd. And I read a wonderful quote, a wonderful statement by E.O. Wilson, um, an entomologist at Harvard. Yes, yes. famous naturalist. And he said, the foreign policy of ants could be described this way, restless aggression constant conquest uh, of other territories, enslavement of the others. I'm, it's just, I'm not doing it as well as I could. And he said, if the ants had the bomb, they'd blow up the world in a week. So I realized that this is not animality at play. This is insect behavior, the level at which foreign policy is conducted. And so... <laughs> This is the time for us to come online with the divine to find ways to keep uh, boosting our immune system. And you advertise such wonderful products, Paul, that, that do that, that, that as much as we possibly can do our best to protect ourselves without resorting to that, uh, to the jab. And God knows what's in it. Well, uh, nothing that does anything they say it does, which is, you know, more sleight of hand and black magic, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, I could go on on that topic for hours, as I'm sure you know. I think really what I'm hearing you say, if I and convert it to my own words, is that we're creative beings and that we are naturally social beings and that if we use our creativity and our language to bring us together and harmonize, then we will be far stronger than the forces working to segregate us and isolate us. And I think that that, you know, it brings me back to the, you know, the concept in the ocean, how little schools of fish gather together to create the illusion of a big fish to scare the big fish away. And so I think that, you know, if I think the first step for those people that have submitted themselves to getting the vaccination, the jab, whatever you want to call it, is that they 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 haven't spent the time to think critically because they believe anything that's said to be in the name of science is true. But I think the first step toward healing is to demand real science and the truth. And if there is a viral threat, then we should use the abilities that science has to create a vaccination that's less threatening than what we're trying to heal with it. And, and the fact that we have the ability to put rockets on the moon and do all sorts of wild and crazy stuff scientifically but we're not using that ingenuity to create safe vaccinations should alert everybody to the fact that there's an ulterior motive and all the censoring stinks very badly. And the fact that they've made it illegal to sue the manufacturers should be a huge ass scarecrow and the bonfire and the sound of death. But people aren't actually using common sense and their rational faculty, they're just playing out this spell cast that you have been so beautifully describing. And I think really that we have to be very careful that we don't let the situation break us into two camps, those that are thinking rationally, but those that are under the spell, because then what happens is you're much more susceptible to the conflict. And in order for us to really bring harmony to the planet, we have to find language that's all inclusive or we're, we're going to continue to do to ourselves what's being done to us, which means they've got the virus already in us. Well, it's, and it's, wasn't it one of the founding fathers united, we stand divided, we fall. Yes. And, and so I, I completely agree. And as much as we can, focus on the heart chakra and uh, the heart math breathing that helps create brain heart coherence. Um, I've gotten, oh, 
in terms of your children speaking, I, I worked years ago with a man named David, I think it's John David Oates or David John Oates. He founded Reverse Speech that shows we speak backward first and also simultaneously. So people might want to look at reversespeech.com. And I've gotten so much value from something called the three principles, which came from an enlightenment experience uh, that a Scottish mystic had in the 70s. And so Dr. Amy Johnson is one of the exponents of that. And Michael Neal, there's Dr. William Pettit and his wife and Dr. Pettit. What it is, is that what we think of as reality is our own thoughts uh, made real in our feelings. And so we're, so we're creating all sorts of disturbance with the thinking. And when we're exposing ourselves to the media and the terror, it's intentionally propagating and the so-called entertainment that is about violence and ugliness. It's like cheapers. It's all catering to our lowest nature. And I don't remember where I heard this, but the description that we are like um, an angel sitting on the shoulders of a monkey riding on the back of a dinosaur. So there's that that um, animality in us. There's the, and, and there's so much in the society that's looking to operate us like puppets. And, and it takes what, what you do, what I do. I mean, even like that um, heart meditation with Dr. Marie C H I S S O N, I believe it's like a five minute meditation where you, do you know a, a window washing on your heart? I think that was her expression. And I heard someone else say, a spiritual teacher, that every day she has to reconstitute her consciousness. And I experience that too, which is why I do things that bring the nervous system into a more calm state and help me recognize that what looks at lo- uh, horrible at one level of consciousness, as if I'm looking out a basement window, that same situation when I'm able to elevate my perspective to the penthouse, then I see that it is a gift wrapped in a challenge. And I know from that place that I can meet it successfully and use it as a stepping stone to something higher. Yes. I think it's the perfect situation that we've unconsciously called forward as a collective because there's no way out of it except to harmonize together. They've cast a very powerful net, but it's a net of illusion. Once we harmonize together and get clear on what our collective dream is and then stop putting money, time, or energy into anything that is not part of the collective dream, then the dinosaurs that are controlling the uh, the show are going to starve to death because their machines are very, very hungry for money. So we have to identify what beast has to be starved and be disciplined to stop using the networks and the whatever platforms it is that this stuff is being disseminated through and literally starve them out. Uh, And then I think we will be a lot better off and we'll have made contact with each other. And I think behind this is that we need something to draw us together as a humanity to get us past racial, ethnic, uh, religious biases, because this situation puts everybody in equal box. It doesn't matter if you're a super star movie star, the greatest musician in the world, the greatest athlete in the world, uh, or mother saint, anybody. You you are in the box with us. I even saw the Dalai Lama got jabbed, as you say, which shocked the piss out of me. And I'm like, okay, we we really are getting infected even at the highest levels of spiritually uh, enlightened people. And so I think we've all got to say, okay, we have a situation where we've all got to get together and ask ourselves, what is the future we want for our children? And what is it 
what is necessary to support life for all of us. And we need to orient ourselves toward that. And we have the resources to feed all the hungry people in the world. We have the resources to get water to everybody. The amount of money that's been wasted on this scam, we could have cleaned up the soil, cleaned up the oceans, cleaned up the garbage and fed the hungry and stabilized the poor. But instead, we've bought into this show at a very, very high price. And the people that were hurting when it came on are even in worse shape now because everybody's eyes are turned away from the real problems of the of the world, the actual problems of the world, not the created ones. Yes, you said that so perfectly and so well. And I, I certainly agree. And we have had the resources like uh, for decades and we haven't had the will. So this crisis is giving many the will to um, overcome our fears and step forward as our greater self. And I would sure love to hear from people who are animators and illustrators who can help me put more and more of this work out into the world as, as opportunities for awakening through this metaphysical mother goose approach. So it's not threatening. It's the truth we've known from the very beginning that we remember as we awaken uh, who we are, what we're here for, and why we're here at this very catalytic time that um, is the possibility for actualizing our divinity more fully at the same time as what the powers that be are endeavoring what um, a guest on Higher Side Chat, Allison, someone said yesterday, a coup of God. You know, these little minds that have always wanted to play God upon the planet. And uh, we are all divine. And it only comes through the generosity, the kindness, the speaking beauty, and the healing and sharing. And so. I'm yes. Well, it's been an amazing conversation. I've learned a lot, and you've certainly triggered off a lot of deep soul movement in me. Uh, where can people find out more about you and your work? And I'm sure there's potentially people listening that are illustrators, animators, musicians, artists. So if people want to reach you, how's the best way to get a, a, in touch with you? And, and where would you like to direct people to experience more of your work or find your books and things like that? Thank you so much. So my website is wordmagicglobal.com. And I have blogs and podcasts and um, classes. If you look on the event page, I lead writing circles that bring together people from all over the world who know they have a message to convey and would like the support and feedback of others. I also uh, teach word magic. Um, there are prior recorded classes that are available to purchase. And I'm also um, going to do a new recording of it. Um, new books to come. There's going to be the uh, animation of Esoterica by Laurel Erica. That You'll find out about that by going on my website, uh, signing up on wordmagicglobal.com, you instantly get to um, download my free ebook, which is called The Book of E, A Book of Alphabet Alchemy. And it's a whole lot of fun. And um, there are more books coming. And your loving support and participation is what liber liberates me to bring these out into the wider world. And I thank you so much. Yeah, what a great pleasure, and I can't encourage all of you enough. Uh, Laurel's books and her writings are quite mind-blowing, as you've just found out. Uh, I like the fact that when you're reading what she writes, you have time to process it. Listening to her is like an experience that you have. But to digest it and say, how can I use this in my life? I think it's great to read these things. And I've really enjoyed what I've read of your work. I, I, I find myself being thrown into 
deep aha awakening moments and meditative experiences. So it's, it's really, uh, I'm really grateful that you're here with all of us at this time. And I'm grateful that you have the life experience that you have because you're at the point in your life where you know what is and isn't truly important. And I think that makes you um, a healing force. Thank you. Well, that's the intention is just to be embodying, emanating, and radiating the highest, most catalytic frequencies of infinite divine love and intelligence, because that's who we actually are, all of us. And I I do have a YouTube channel, and there are some YouTube videos on it. I have many more to do, just have not been doing them, not all that comp comfortable in front of a camera, but um, we'll promise to do more and get my bloated nothingness out of the way. What's the URL for that? It's, uh, I believe it's Laurel Erica, L-A-U-R-E-L-A-I-R-I-C-A for the YouTube channel. It may be Word Magic Global. I'm not entirely sure. Well, anyone can just search Laurel Erica and they'll, they'll find it right on YouTube. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to my podcast sponsors for all the amazing products they share and their sustainable practices. They're a great example for all other companies in the world. I wouldn't share it with you if it didn't work. I use everything that I share on the podcast through the sponsors myself and anything you buy from them, a little commission goes to the podcast to help me keep the podcast running and bring people like the amazing Laurel Erica to you. So thank you for all your love. I hope you guys all agree that right now is the time for us to hold hands and circle the globe as a family and get clear what we will not stand for and what we must create together so that our children have a better future and the world has a chance to heal and we can make more harmony together. We've already experienced enough disharmony. Let's go for the harmony concept. And uh, I'm with you all the way. I, I, I love life and I love my children and I love knowing that as human beings, we're powerful enough to overcome the resistance that's present right now and, and that it's here to help us grow and, and get clear on what we want to create together. So lots of love, all of you. I'll talk to you soon. Lots more great guests coming. And uh, let's let's do it together. We are safe. We are home. We are whole. A whole great spirit. It is done. It is done. It is done. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Laurel Erica. You can find Laurel on Instagram at Word Magic Global or watch her videos on YouTube at Laurel Erica. Visit her website at wordmagicglobal.com where you can sign up to be notified of her upcoming Word Magic Word Shops and Sacred Rites Writing Circles. Laurel is giving her listeners her ebook, The Book of E, a book of alphabet alchemy, and you can find the download link on the homepage of her website. Follow Paul on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Czech videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chekiva.com. Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Oh,